Hello and welcome to Dialogue. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Lee Yellen has wrapped up a five-day visit to China where she met with top Chinese academic, political and financial leaders in Guangzhou and Beijing. High on her list of topics was the acquisition of so-called China's production overcapacity in green technologies and the U.S. fears that the Chinese exports could harm its interests. So what is overcapacity? Is there an overcapacity issue in China? Is the U.S. overreacting to China's successful green technological development? Join us for our discussion today, live from Beijing. I'm Xu Qinduo. Joining me today are Zhao Hai, Director of International Political Studies at the National Institute for Global Strategy, He Wei Wen, Senior Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, and Paul Gillis, Professor of Accounting at Beijing International Studies University. Welcome to Dialogue. Zhao Hai, I will start with you. So this is the second trip by Secretary Yellen in less than a year's time. So what is the significance of this, uh, the timing, the visit, and uh, you know, what do you make of her visit? Well, I think there's no uh, specific meaning of her meeting is other than this is a follow-up meeting uh, to the San Francisco summit. Uh, after that, I think two countries have made a lot of uh, arrangement for uh, high-level officials communicating communicating with each other and keep the communication channels open. And uh, I think uh, Janet Yellen's visit shows that the importance of China-U.S. financial economic relations. And she, as the leader of the uh, U.S. side, uh, keep talking with the Chinese side and uh, discussing important issues between the two countries is a very important part of that dialogue. And that shows that uh, China and U.S. continue to make progress under the two leaders' direction, uh, particularly after the recent call between President Xi and President uh, Biden. And I think uh, after that, there will be other high-level officials from the United States coming to visit China, as well as Chinese officials visit the U.S. Uh, fundamentally, this is the effort to maintain stable relations between the two countries, particularly in this election year uh, in, the United States, in the United States. Mm -hmm. So keeping the relations stable and also uh, keeping the channels open, that's uh, more uh, significant in terms of the visit. Uh, Professor Paul Gillis, uh, what are your takeaways from Secretary Yellen's visit here? I think the, uh, what, it, what it reflects is the United States and China both want to try to keep the uh, uh, relationship alive. I think it was headed in the wrong direction for quite a long time, and I think they're, they're both hopeful to, uh, uh, to keep things on an even keel until after the election. Mm, all right, stability, and of course, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, topics, uh, you know, in uh, during her stay in China, there are uh, quite a few, of course, and so, uh, uh, Mr. He, so w what do you think, uh, uh, you know, have been this uh, probably the, the key issues uh, raised by Secretary Yellen, and probably also, you know, uh, concerning the Chinese side too. Oh, yes. Uh, of course, uh, Secretary Yellen has said that uh, they fished, uh, her latest trip to China was quite successful, fruitful. I mean, uh, she concluded in three different aspects as achievements. However, she also raised the great concern of the overcapacity of China's uh, industry, especially the new energy industry and the solar panel, uh, electric vehicles, and uh, lithium cells. And she also said they blamed China for industrial policies subsidizing the industry and so as to make Chinese products too competitive in the world and uh, competing the European and the American companies are not able to, unable to survive. So that's her main target for convincing China, to convince the Chinese government to make changes in these respects. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, there are, uh, you know, substantial agreements, like uh, both sides agree to work with each other, such as uh, fighting the money laund uh, laundry, you know, across national borders, etc. Uh, so that's, uh, that maybe that's a very positive sign of um, the two countries uh, to work together in the areas that uh, they feel comfortable. Mr. He? Oh, yes. Uh, I think they are uh, doing the right thing in the right direction. Uh, and they think that because uh, General, uh, General Yellen 
is the finance, uh, is the secretary of the treasury. Her duties is covering macroeconomic management and monetary and finance affairs. So her focus with talking when talking with the Chinese finance ministry is focusing on the macroeconomic policies and also U.S.-China coordination supporting the balanced world economic development. Also, uh, cooperation on the world financial stability, including fighting the financial money laundering and so on and so forth. That is necessary, all necessary to keep a healthy financial environment of the world so as to sustain, sustain the world economic recovery and development. Yeah, that's had uh, a lot to do with uh, the, um, uh, the size of the two economies, of course, the two largest economies in uh, the world. Of course, their cooperation in this respect is critical. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Gillis, you know, ahead of her trip uh, to China, Yellen, uh, basically talked about uh, you know um, what U.S. calls excess of Chinese production in the green technology sector. You know EV, uh, uh, lithium uh, battery, of course, uh, uh, solar panel, etc. Uh, tell us, you know, seems overcapacity is a keyword of um, or one of the keywords of her visit to China. Tell us, you know, is there a definition? What is overcapacity? Is there a you know classical or widely accepted? Uh, uh, definition of overcapacity? I don't know if there's a widely accepted uh, definition, but uh, it's quite clear what, what is meant by overcapacity is the ability to produce more than the market can absorb, uh, which would tend to result in an oversupply, which will result in reducing prices and reducing profits. Uh, now, China is in part a victim of its own success. Uh, China, China had an industrial policy that identified those areas as important to the future economy and invested in, uh, in making sure that those economy, those businesses and electric vehicles are in, in uh, electric vehicles and batteries uh, would, would be in solar panels would be, uh, uh, would be done and done at scale and done early. And now China is able to produce these products at a, uh, at a very high quality, at uh, at a lower price than many others who are trying to enter the market late, and that makes it difficult for them. And China could freeze them out of the market. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Professor Gillis, you know, if you look at the response from the Chinese side, uh, they quoted this figure here. According to the International Energy Agency's estimates, uh, the global demand for new energy vehicles will reach 45 million uh, units by 2030. Uh, that would be uh, 4.5 times that of 2022. The global demand for new photovoltaic installations will reach 880 gigawatts, approximately four times that of 2022. Uh, so current production capacities are far from meeting market demand. Uh, so, you know, people say it's really about which market in terms of meeting the demand of the market. It, does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. And I think uh, that uh, many countries around the world have underestimated the conversion to electric vehicles that we're seeing underway right now. And, uh, and there's certainly political opposition to it in many parts of the world um, by those who are either tied to fossil fuel, in, uh, fuel approaches or those that, uh, that simply want to resist any kind of change uh, become the view that it's a more liberal approach than, uh, than they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Joe, hi. Of course, you know, others would argue, you know, this is uh, the market economy. If you look at the Chinese market, uh, there are, uh, you know, dozens of, uh, some would say almost 100 uh, EV companies here. They're competing with each, with each other vehemently uh, in being more innovative, being, uh, pro you know, or producing better uh, equipped cars with a lower price, uh, more competitive prices. Is there anything wrong with that? Well, I think uh, to use the word overcapacity is completely uh, wrong. And it's uh, the fundamental issue here is competition. And the US side is fear of competition with China in many of those uh, new uh, developing areas, uh, including EVs and batteries and things you mentioned. Um, so the US is approaching this from two angles. One is uh, Janet Yellen, Secretary Yellen's angle, which is that uh, China has an overcapacity problem, which means that China's aggregated demand is not enough to, con 
consume uh, most of the products produced domestically, therefore uh, China exporting to other countries with low price. And that's, uh, you know, flooding other countries with cheap products. That means, you know, China needs to solve this problem uh, domestically from its own policies. Uh, but then there's another angle, which is uh, Jack uh, Sullivan's, uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan's angle, which is saying that uh, there's an energy se uh, national security problem, uh, which means if China controls the supply chain of the EVs and batteries, that will create the same level of national security problem for the United States, equal to the oil prices, uh, oil crisis in the 1970s uh, and the natural gas crisis in 2022. Uh, so I think uh, in both cases, these are just uh, uh, excuses to shield American industries that the U.S. is using industrial policy to prop up uh, and to basically protect its own domestic industry. Uh, that's one reason. Of course, there's an underlying, uh, another hidden reason, which is U.S. election. Um, you know, we all know that uh, Michigan and other uh, industrial states in the United States is the battleground states, and Biden needs to win those states, and they, he needed the votes of the uh, you know, big automobile industries, including their uh, manufacturing working jobs, uh, those votes, and therefore, you know, shielding and uh, keeping Chinese com competition outside of the United States is essential to getting those votes. So at this point, I think uh, it's very unconvincing uh, to use the word overcapacity to accuse China to produce uh, more EVs in this area. Just like you said, actually, there's more demand than supply in the world. And that's why Chinese cars are so popular. EV cars are so popular. Uh, so at the end of the day, I think um, we need to have a di That's why we need to have a dialogue to make sure that the intentions is right and the solutions is right. Otherwise, it will only keep and delay the timing of, of the time of uh, green energy and, and, and new uh, you know, industrial um, capacity to solve the problem of global uh, climate change. And, and that's one of the reasons, uh, actually one of the areas that Democrats and President Biden uh, is uh, supporting. So they're having a self-contradicting policies uh, with themselves and also towards China. Uh, so that's why from Chinese perspective, it's not making any sense. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Professor Gillis, uh, you think, uh, you know, the auto, let's say, auto works union uh, important to Biden uh, in states like Michigan, uh, you know, because of uh, the, this is election year, of course, you know, uh, candidates like uh, President Biden and uh, Trump, of course, they will uh, competed to be tough on China, to have this policy to protect the, you know, uh, workers' interests, for example. Uh, so there's a there's a, an element of a political consideration here. Yes, absolutely. I think politics is playing a big part in, in, in all of this, and it makes it very difficult to reach a solution. And I don't think anything can be really done until after the election. Uh, I think everyone was surprised that we did not see. Uh, uh, a uh, significant change when Biden came in. Uh, we thought he would reverse most of Trump's policies, but he did not do so. And uh, But I think right now the sentiment in America is very anti-China. And, and I, I think there's a great desire among U.S. politicians to prevent another occurrence like we saw uh, when, when so many manufacturing jobs left the United States and went to China. <clears throat> and, and they don't want to see that happen again. Uh, even though it may be those jobs never even get created if Ch if China wins the uh, the market in new industries such as EVs. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting point. We'll get back to that uh, probably, uh, Mr. He. You know, in a in a market, if you follow the laws of the market, of course, you know. Uh, however, uh, competition or fierce uh, the competition, uh, you know, how fierce it is. Uh, the good thing is like you will have a better price. You have a better quality products. Uh, and uh, if they produce something that cannot be sold, the company probably will go bankrupt. That's the law of the market. And uh, either overcapacity issue, even there is, probably that's the overcapacity of the com individual companies. Uh, why should the U.S. be concerned with that? Uh, I think the overcapacity issue of EVs, uh, especially regarding China, uh, should not be proposed by the United States because China's EV has no threat at all to the U.S. market. If you look at the trade data, you can find that China's uh, automobiles export to the United States last year was minimal. 
and spare parts of automobiles was exported from China to the U.S. was only $18.5 billion, less than 4% of the U.S. market. So how could China pose the threat to the U.S. workers and the industries? And the total of China's export to the United States in uh, 2023 was 11, oh, 11, uh, 110 billion dollars less than five years ago, 2018. So China's export to the U.S. was decreasing all the time. So how could China pose threat, especially EVs? I think this is important for Secretary Yellen because she echoed what the echoes of the United States in the U U.S. political ecology, especially in the election year that China poses a threat to the U.S., hurting the American workers and the industries. That's the political correct. So she proposed that and talked that to China. But mm -hmm. that is not the right solution. The right solution is China, U.S., the automobile industry, especially in the EV industry, should cooperate. Because we also see that the CATL, China major leading China's uh, EV cell company also had a good supply contracts with American companies supplying the cells to the United States and making both win. That's a good solution. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you mentioned about uh, you know uh, uh, cooperation rather than let's say the the or the potential or the prospect of uh, a trading war or tariff war, let's say between the two economies. Uh, now, I have this question for. Uh, you know, for you and also Paul probably here. That is, you know, uh, if you look at the 1980s, 1990s, you know, the Japanese car industry, you know, that was also perceived as a threat to the U.S. industries. Uh, you know, the solution is to have uh, Japanese companies invest in the United States and create jobs and also pay taxes. So that's a win-win solution. What, what's the likelihood, like, uh, of? Um, you know, opening the door for the Chinese uh, uh, investors uh, in the EV in the United States, uh, Mr. He. Uh, Mr. He. Oh, yes. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I was, uh, Go ahead. Uh, I think uh, Japan, uh, the case of Japan in the 1980s provided a very good example. Uh, in the early 1980s, the, United, the U.S. automobile industry could not compete with the low-priced Japanese cars, especially after the oil crisis in the 1970s. So the U.S. government had no other choice but to have the quantitative restrictions on the Japanese cars. That's auto, automotive. Uh, that's uh, well, later, so the Japanese car makers had no other choice but to invest in the United States. In the time, during my service in San Francisco in late 1990s, Toyota was the largest car makers in North America. So that's a win-win case. Mm -hmm. the Japan win one and the American one. Mm -hmm. So I think China and the United States could also they have the similar pattern that the United States should welcome China's automotive, especially EV producers to invest in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and so as to create jobs and also pro uh, push up the industry in the United States. But the problem, I think, in the United States and Biden administration, the concept is not employment, jobs. The concept is national security. Uh -huh. They said, China's investment in the EVs in the United States will create a serious national security issue. So if that is created, this uh, narrative, it will disturb the whole picture. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Professor Paul Gillis, what are the chances of having the Chinese investors doing investment in the U.S., creating jobs, you know, etc.? Um, or is there a like, more likely that uh, they will be seen as, uh, you know, a successful Chinese company, you know, the Apple, uh, TikTok, you know, <laughs> as long as it's a Chinese company, that's a threat to the U.S. security? I think that is the general attitude right now, and I think that will make it difficult for uh, that solution to work as well. I mean, Japan was an ally when, when Japan uh, uh, built its plants in the United States, and, the, and China is not viewed as an ally of the United States at present. So I think it will be more challenging uh, to just fix this problem by by building some of these Chinese EVs in the United States. 
Well, uh, speak of that, you know, Doc, here is that, you know, if you look at the remarks by U.S. senior officials, so there's a, let's say, lack of consistency. You know, Commerce uh, Secretary Raimondo talked about, uh, you know, like a, a million Chinese cars running on the U.S. streets. So, you know, somehow Beijing could stop them all of a sudden, all the data issue. But now uh, Secretary Janet Yellen is talking about overcapacity. So <laughs> it seems like there are different uh, either excuses or the, they have a different understanding of this issue. Anyway, somehow because of the political issues, uh, you know, the lack of cooperating with each other to solve this problem is not that, uh, that strong. Exactly. Uh, that's that's why this uh, so whole thing is, uh, from an economic perspective, is a non-issue. It is a political issue. Uh, because right now, um, as uh, Mr. Her has uh, pointed out, that uh, the U.S. is imposing 27.5% uh, tax on Chinese cars uh, importing into the United States. So that's why there's very uh, limited number of Chinese cars exporting to the United States. And, and Chinese makers... Uh, wanted to build factories in the United States, but because of national security concerns, the U.S. refused uh, to even allow that. Uh, even uh, CLT, the battery company, wants to build a factory in uh, Michigan, has re met with political resistance um, from the Republican side. And also, the Chinese you know, manufacturers trying to uh, get around that tariff by building factories in Mexico. And now, the uh, Biden administration is starting a initiating an investigation in the Commerce Department against that effort. That means that even if Chinese makers uh, make uh, cars or parts in Mexico has become a national security problem because of the eBay cars and uh, other you know applicants has uh, you know Chinese chips and Chinese um, technologies contained in it. As uh, you know, Secretary Raimondo has pointed out uh, that she is concerned about suddenly three million cars stop running in uh, in the United States. Uh, even though from Chinese perspective, it's really ridiculous. However, I think that's the, uh, as Paul has pointed out, that's the political environment that is very poisonous environment right now going on in the United States, and particularly in Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, we know that Biden administration is under huge pressure from Congress, and particularly from those uh, anti-China uh, people in Congress uh, trying to create new laws, uh, even further restricting Chinese export to the United States. Mm -hmm. So I think without, uh, again, without the right perception of China and without a right definition of national security, it's very hard to proceed to moving forward uh, to have a win-win economic relationship between the two countries. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Mr. Hur, you know, of course, uh, the uh, Biden administration indeed uh, raised the concern and also basically um, talked about the threat uh, for more tariffs for Chinese uh, uh, EVs. Uh, and also uh, Trump, the former president, uh, the candidate of the Republican Party, also talked about imposing 60 mm percent -hmm. or increasing uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the tariff by 60 percent. You know, people are concerned whether there will be a new trade war between the two countries. Uh, we have to wait and see, uh, watch the developments closely. And I do not quite believe in what Trump has said, because he might say this today, might say that tomorrow. And also when he said 60%, the real tariff rate might be 30%, uh, because he was, he was talking very uh, casually. And we should not take them too seriously. Mm -hmm. However, I think the difference between Trump and Biden is clear. Trump is based on the commercial values. He is seeking for commercial interests. And Biden looks for more security and political purposes. So if we compare what the Trump administration did during the four years' time to China and trade disputes and trade suppression, and compared with what the Biden administration has been doing in the small yard high fence, we could find out easily that the practice and the policy of the Biden administration is more dangerous to China. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, to be fair, uh, Secretary 
Janet Yellen, uh, you know, did uh, reiterate uh, her stance against economic decoupling between the U.S. and China at, at least twice in China publicly. Uh, Professor Paul Gillis, you know, why do you think Yellen repeatedly emphasized her opposition to economic decoupling between the two uh, countries here? I think there is a recognition that uh, economic decoupling just simply would hurt both countries quite badly, and uh, that the United States could not survive without China, nor can China survive without the United States. So they need to find a way to work together. And things were clearly headed on the wrong track, where we were moving towards greater conflict. And I think there is a recognition of that and a desire to try to uh, smooth things over as best as possible. In, in what's going to be some difficult times ahead as we deal with issues like TikTok and uh, EVs. Mm -hmm. uh, John Hai, tell us, you know, uh, is her view popular in Washington? Well, I think at least her view is controversial. Um, some people, of course, particularly uh, the business community, that have large interest in China will support her idea. And, uh, you know, the economists know that the two largest economy in the world cannot decouple. It's not realistic. However, there's another group of people uh, like the former USTR, um, uh, you know, Lighthizer has emphasized that uh, he wanted to strategically decouple uh, between China and the United States. So I actually believe that uh, uh, Trump, if elected, will go through with his promise uh, adding tariffs against China, either 50, 60 percent, doesn't matter because any higher tariff will uh, dramatically reduce the trade between the two countries. So we're facing real danger moving forward. And I think uh, after visiting the business community in Guangzhou and in other parts of China, uh, Janet Yellen must hear uh, the real voice from the ground uh, that uh, the U.S. business really need Chinese market and China also need the U.S. market. So this is, uh, I, I think, a very difficult time. And hopefully her voice, or a very rational voice, will prevail in Washington, D.C. in the coming days. But uh, I think that needs time. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Hur, you know, looking ahead, uh, do you think Yellen's recent visit has helped to pave the way for more exchanges and cooperation between the two countries? Definitely, yes. We should say that although there are disputes and uh, different opinions about uh, the results and deliveries of what uh, the General Yellen has uh, resulted uh, from her trip to China. We should say that this is a correct step in the right direction, followed by the course charted by the two presidents of China and the United States. That is San Francisco vision. The China and United States should sit together to have a dialogue mechanism so as to manage differences and avoid the conflicts so as to stabilize the relationship between the two largest economies of the world, so as not only to benefit the two countries, but also benefit the world. So this is, of course, we have the tremendous differences because we have the fundamental differences in the ideology and the value but, and so on and so forth. However, both countries feel that we have to cooperate. So that is the general direction. Under this direction, we have to do hard work, and we have set up a mechanism, dialogues in different ministries, foreign ministries, the finance ministries, the commerce ministries, and different working groups working step by step. These are good steps towards the right direction. And of course, we have big differences, as we said. So dialogues, for candid, straightforward, constructive is necessary, but dialogues are not enough. We have to shoot practical issues mm -hmm. and get our work to the down to the earth base so right. as to step by step move forward. Yes, and so we as have to, to keep the relation stop there, there. Uh, Mr. He. With that, we come to the end of today's discussion. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu Qinduo. See you next time.